I said I want you to give a TED style talk, so uh, so that means short. Yeah. So uh, I'm a material scientist. Yeah. I think okay. This is a multidisciplinary group. I'll identify uh, my background as a material scientist. Uh, represent the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory of Materials Manufacturing Directorate. A lot of ways that we use data in the development of materials. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with using um, uh, large data for uh, characterizing materials. Uh, data sets can take uh, several gigabytes uh, per session. That's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, 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 the value of data in uh, accelerating the development of, of new materials. And I'll talk in particular about uh, compositionally complex alloys. Okay, so, uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, as material scientists, we, we feel that we can understand the material if we can understand its crystal structure, and we know the atoms that occupy the different sites. And so uh, we can model the behavior of the material by, uh, I show here an element of uh, 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 some particular, there we go. Um, even if we have a small amount of, of, of a second element, a solute, uh, we can still be, um, we can still model the behavior of the material as, as the element with some, uh, some modification. Uh, let's see, I'll make it to just do that. There we go. Uh, and even as a concentrated solid solution, if the, uh, if the solute atoms, the blue ones, are disordered, it still acts very much like uh, uh, the host atom or, or the solvent atom species. If, uh, if those solute atoms are ordered, now the material behaves different than either the, the gray or the blue atom, but we can still understand the behavior of these materials uh, by understanding the interaction between a single pair of atoms. So uh, what I've just clicked through in the last few clicks represents about the last 150 years of alloy development, uh, where we stick, start with some base element and then we modify it uh, by adding uh, different types of elements, usually as a minority of species. So this is what I mean when I say compositional complex. This, uh, this material has what we think of as an identity crisis. It has uh, five or more elements, all of them at some at a, a major level of concentration. And so no single atom dominates, and no single atom here dominates. In fact, this alloy that I show here with five elements, instead, instead of having one atom pair to worry about, you have 15 atom pairs to worry about. And you can't focus on one single atom pair or two single pairs and say, that's what's going to dominate it. I'll simplify it by looking at that. You have to consider all of them. And so uh, this is a relatively new way of looking at materials, and it offers uh, a number of different things. Uh, one of the things that, that brought this to people's attention is that it has a relatively high configuration entropy that uh, uh, influences stability, and it can also have relatively large lattice rates, which will uh, influence uh, the properties we believe in some ways uh, still be determined. Okay, so uh, so that's what a composition complex alloy is. What does it offer us? And, and of course, it offers a new way to control stability and properties. I don't want to talk about that right now. In, in my opinion, uh, the, the major value added by this approach is that it opens a vast realm of composition space that's never been considered before. And let me just uh, try to illustrate that. You see the, uh, the gray bar at the bottom, uh, about 10 alloy systems has taken us through about the last 150 years. Iron-based alloys, nickel-based alloys, aluminum-based alloys, tin, copper, and so on, uh, with modifications with small solute additions as, as I've shown you. Now if we uh, ask how many compositionally complex alloy systems can we uh, produce, we use the, the big bracket equation and choose R. Uh, so for example, if we have 12 elements and ask how many ways can we take five elements from those 12, how many can we take? Six from those 12 uh, and so on. From a pallet of 12 elements, we can get about 3,000 different systems. 3,000 systems compared to 10. If we have a pallet of 20 elements, that gives us over a million different systems. Not alloys, a million different systems. And so uh, you can see that we have orders of magnitude more systems to consider uh, than we've looked at before. And so uh, we feel that this is one of the, uh, the biggest opportunities offered by these compositionally complex alloys. What's the problem? The problem is the, the same thing. The problem is the vast number of systems to look at. Uh, the way I like to uh, capitalize this is uh, people will say, there's a thousand opportunities, a million, a billion. I'll study this one. And so 
there's, there's no real way to look at the vast array of possibilities systematically. We need a new way of looking at alloys uh, relative to the way that we've done it. The way we do it now is we make machine and measure one alloy at a time. It takes us months, six months maybe, uh, to characterize one particular alloy. If we could characterize four alloys in a day, it would still take us a thousand years to go through uh, a million different possibilities. And so we definitely need a different way of looking at these materials. How would we, how would we start? So uh, I, I want to emphasize that we're trying to design new alloys. We're not just, just randomly making alloys and seeing what we get. So we are trying to produce uh, a balance of properties for an intended application. And so I, I show here, uh, by the way, uh, my bias, structural materials for transportation. And so that will uh, dictate which properties you look at as, uh, as important properties. So I show here uh, the, the standard palette for uh, uh, transportation and aerospace in particular, aluminum alloys, titanium alloys, nickel alloys. Most important thing, density and melting temperature. If the part moves or if the system moves, density matters. And uh, to improve the efficiency of uh, power uh, conversion and so on, temperature matters. And so these other things matter as well. And, and there are other things as well that I haven't shown you, but this is probably the short list of the most important things that we would like to look at uh, as, as we screen sort of alloys. So this gives us a, a way of looking at the different alloys. And I'm going to use this uh, to help sort through the, uh, the literally the astronomical number of possibilities. So, so what we did is we took the periodic table and we threw away anything that doesn't look like the metal. If it was gaseous or liquid at room temperature, if it's radioactive, if, if it's toxic, we threw it out. And you end up with a list of about 43 elements here. The list is too big to do anything useful with. If, if we ask, uh, again, the end choose our problem, how many ways can we choose five elements from these 43, it's over a million. And if you ask how many ways can you take five elements, or six elements, or seven elements, it's 10 to the 13th. The number is, is too large, even in, in our wild dream. So we do have to simplify this uh, somehow. So what we do is we select the elements from this list based on their density and melting temperature uh, that would uh, be most consistent with the three different uh, families that I just showed. So you see, I have a, a, a low temperature palette, a medium temperature palette, and a high temperature palette. And we choose elements based on their density and melting temperature that uh, may be appropriate for those balance of properties. Now we have, instead of 43 elements, we have a dozen or a dozen and a half. And now the numbers become much more tractable. Uh, the number of compositional and complex alloys that you can choose from any one of those palettes is a few thousand or a few tens of thousands. Uh, and I'm saying that rather flippantly, but I'll tell you this is, this is a different way of thinking in the materials development community. One of our colleagues sent me an email saying, Dan, the numbers scare me. And so this, is, this really is a, a very much different way uh, in, in going about it. And so we, we do need to come up with new ways of quickly evaluating and screening these alloys. And so uh, this is not surprising. You, like, uh, you start with a lot of alloys, and you like to come up with a way uh, that narrows them down quickly, uh, and where the amount of time you spend on any given alloy is inversely proportional to the number of alloys you're considering at that stage. And so we've set up a, a, a three three tier process uh, where we start with phase diagram calculations. I'll talk about that. Uh, we follow that up with high throughput experiments where composition is the primary variable. For those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, materials libraries and so on, this would be uh, an approach you might be familiar with. And then in the third stage, uh, we talk about high experiments where microstructure is the primary variable. I won't talk about that here. So just quickly, uh, probably appropriate to say a little bit about complexity. Uh, we're all dealing with this. Uh, three, three quotes that I like to use. Uh, Anderson's Law, there's no problem no matter how complex, which upon careful analysis does not become more complex. A number of you work in academia, and, and, and we embrace this uh, quite tightly. I'm going to say that that's, that's too complex for what we're working with. For every complex problem, there's a solution that is simple, needed, and wrong. Quote by H.L. Mencken, political commentary fellow from the early 1900s. That's too simple. Um, and, uh, and then everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Our buddy Albert Einstein, and that's right, just right. This is the, uh, the Goldilocks approach, too big, too little, just right. And so, uh, so if we want to simplify 
the complexity problem here, the first thing that we deal with is microstructure. And believe me, this is a complex problem. If I say that it's a 10-dimensional problem or more, I'm not exaggerating. So you can see a number of the dimensions here. Uh, and, so, uh, and so in our approach, we simplify the microstructure by looking only at uh, the basic, the most basic microstructure description. How many phases are there? Uh, what phases are they? And what are their temperatures of reaction? This information you can get from phase diagrams. Uh, for my uh, materials scientist buddies who are used to seeing binary phase diagrams, maybe ternary phase diagrams, I'm showing here a phase diagram for a four element system. You can't plot it in two dimensions. Uh, and so the way that uh, uh, CalFAT and other approaches normally represented is that in this two dimensional plot where you have temperature on the vertical axis, phase fraction along the horizontal axis. And then as you cool down, you can see how the, the constitution microstructure changes. So you can see above 1600, uh, it's more than 100% liquid. If you follow the solid line, uh, below that line, then you start to get a two-phase mixture of liquid and BCC down to about, uh, probably about, what is that, about 1400. Uh, for a short interval, it's uh, single-phase BCC, and then you start to have uh, another reaction. The BCC starts to transform uh, to this Rave phase. And as you cool down, the volume fraction of the lava phase increases at the expense of the BCC phase. And then at about 500 degrees C, there's uh, an isothermal reaction, maybe a, a eutectic, where some volume fraction of the remaining BCC transforms to a BCC phase. So this is a phase diagram, and we can use something. First of all, we can calculate this, although there are significant errors, and I probably won't have time to talk about that here. But we can calculate this, and we can use data extracted from this output file uh, and, and interrogate whether or not it would be useful as uh, a structural alloy. So just uh, some simple things, uh, even if you're not a material scientist, you'll get this. Uh, what are the things you look for? You, you know what the use temperature is, and I show here uh, uh, a notional use temperature for an alloy like this. First thing is that uh, the melting temperature has to be above your use temperature. I feel pretty comfortable with that. We don't want our blades melting. There should be no single phase uh, transformation below the use temperature. Uh, you don't want the properties of your material changing while you're using it. Uh, it's, it's a simple principle. This alloy would fail that criterion because we have that phase transformation down about 500 degrees C. Um, if, if it's two phase, you'd like to be able to solve one of the phases above the use temperature. That gives you microstructural control so that you can dissolve one of the phases and then uh, precipitate it and nucleate it and grow it under controlled conditions. Uh, and, and you can see some of the other uh, rules as well. Uh, we look for FCC, BCC, uh, or HCP structures or their de derivatives. This is all data that we can extract from the calculation of the phase diagram. So we can calculate these phase diagrams, and I'm skipping over lots of stuff, but uh, it requires a large amount of data to calculate uh, a phase diagram like this. And if we have 15 or 20 different elements, it requires lots and lots of data. We generate a lot of data as well as we go through these calculations. Uh, so, and, and, and by the way, we can literally calculate thousands per day uh, to do this. So, uh, so, so we go through this, um, and, and let's say we, we march through 50,000, 100,000, and we come up with a few hundred that pass our first criteria. Now we move to the next stage, uh, and now we go through high throughput experiments uh, where we have a composition gradient. And we go through various measurements here. I'm not sure, uh, uh, I'm probably running a little short on time, but a, a number of different measurements. Some of this, these measurements we can do now in a high throughput mode. Some of them we cannot. So this is a, a forward-looking program that will definitely stretch where, what we can do today and develop new capabilities that we can't currently do. Uh, but one of the main issues is that the way we do high throughput, the, the way the community does high throughput experiments in pharmaceuticals and, and uh, so on is to miniaturize your test sample. There is an intrinsic length scale in our materials that controls how much we can miniaturize it, and that's the microstructural length scale. So for example, if we have a large grain size, uh, in a small sample, we get single crystal data, and we can take that single crystal data and extrapolate to polycrystal data, uh, no problem. Or we can take a very large sample where uh, you have uh, many, many grains within your sample, and you measure uh, a polycrystalline randomized material directly. But in most cases, uh, the miniaturization gives you that middle ground, and that's, that's a problem. 
because now you have to uh, consider very uh, directly the size scale of the microstructure, orientations, morphologies, and so on. It becomes very, very complicated. And so there's uh, a major issue that has to be worked out there. As I said, I'm not going to talk very much about uh, the, uh, the, third, uh, the third stage. Um, and so what I've tried to do, I haven't been watching the time, but just in a few minutes, I, I tried to outline for you uh, a notional approach. I say notional, actually, we just started this last week. Um, on how um, uh, big data can help, federated data, uh, semantic data links uh, can help in alloy development. Uh, and and uh, maybe you can get some idea of uh, how an approach like this will also be generating large amounts of data, vast amounts of data, and linking that data in some sort of ontology uh, as we go through and build it, uh, I think will have a, a great benefit to our activities as well. So, uh, thank you very much.
uh, used any tools that are not equilibrium, but we have talked about using Shiral equations, for example, and then nucleation equations. Uh, so we haven't gotten to that yet, and, and there, there's experiment involved that we want to do. Experiment is essential when we talk about an ICMSE methodology. We think of the I meaning integrating experiment and computation, not one computation or another computation, which is valid as well. And so uh, experiment is a, is a very important part of this, uh, partly because it generates data uh, that validates the computations or not. So uh, I'd like to talk with you. There are a lot of things we could do uh, and a lot of things we probably will not be doing, partly because of resources, but if, if there are things we can do together, that would be great. All right. All right, one more question. So, so they always say one quick question, but it's not a quick question, it's the answer that you have to watch out for. <laughs> So uh, the question is, uh, we're doing it in a particular way where we do calculations and then look for correlation. And the question is, what if we do it the other way? What, what correlations are we talking about? Well, if you didn't have a given space, So th this is an easy answer. I don't understand the question. And I think we should talk over coffee. <laughs> so, so Jeff, are you saying like the like the symbolic regression where you have a data set and you don't know what the rules are? You could do that or 